Listen up or run for cover. Dropping knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. The, the, the real Robin Bradley Bombs. is dropping. What it is, Bradley, back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs today, folks, in the studio. Do I have a treat for you? I've got the one and only People Shark, Mr. Damon John. Welcome, Damon. What's happening? Thanks for having me. Man, it's my pleasure. Finally, I've been wanting to sit side by side with you because I know that you've got the knowledge in that noggin for years. How long you been at this? Been at what? Just entrepreneur business. Just doing it? Yeah. Woo! I've been at it. Probably about, uh, I don't know, 35, 36, 37 years. I've been doing okay at it for about 25 of those years. So since you were nine. Yeah. Now, now I don't know if you hear dropping bombs. I'm sure you don't, but you're going to after this because you're at least going to listen to your episode, hopefully. I hear it. Yeah. 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 So drop, I'm here. Yeah. Dropping Bombs is basically a podcast where we just shoot the shit, talk mm-hmm. about anything and everything, and hopefully people that are listening, my listeners, which I fondly refer them to, to them as the bomb squad, Mm -hmm. they're listening and they got their own problems and challenges and maybe we hit on one. So they take that bomb, set their own coordinates and blow the shit out of their problem. Make sense? Good for them. I like it. I'm here. Good. Well, I'm glad to have you. It's my, it's my honor and pleasure to have you here, even though you declined on the, on the golden Knights game. That's kind of gay. I just, you know, I'm just not into that, that, you know, it's kind of cold. It's going to be cold over there. Yeah, you yeah. don't go to hockey games and you don't go to fights unless you're. See, if you go to a fight, your first round, then you can see what's going on. You can hear the body hitting the canvas, right? Other than that, the camera guy's ass is in your face, and then the poles are in your face. So you might as well stay home, right? And see now, now listen to him because everybody thinks you know these celebrities get front row and see what what he's having right now is celebrity problems. That is celebrity problems, you know. Because first of all, so so here's the problem though. Right when I go to games and things of that nature, if I'm in a box and I take a snapshot of it, Instagram, people go, "Wow, you're in the you're in the uh, in, in the chief seats because they don't know I'm you know I'm sitting back eating some uh, you know wings, all uh, endless bucket of wings." Yeah. If I sit in the front seat, then somebody's ass is in my face. The camera guys, right, all right, and then if I sit in the middle, they go, "Hey man, what happened? You know, Cuban would be up front, so I just stay home, right? Yeah. I stay home and I watch everything." Well, you have a beautiful new baby. I do have a beautiful new That's baby. That's a good reason to stay home. That is, that is. But don't stay home watching a fight with a beautiful new baby because she's she's busy sticking pup, Peppa Pig in your face, you know. Yeah. Anyway, enjoy the enjoy the game tonight. I will. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful basketball game. I'm disappointed, bro. I had I had I had like a special group selected just in case you accepted. Yeah. And then I have another group in case you didn't. So there's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole group happy that you said no. <laughs> But that's all right. (laughs) Next time, next time. All right, next time. The Golden Knights, folks, if you're not following them, you better get up on it. But anyway, so unbelievable pleasure to have you here today because, again, 36, 37 years, you grew FUBU to frickin' $6 billion empire. Yeah. You've you've invested in hundreds of companies. You've seen the right, the wrong. You've probably been right and wrong. More wrong than right. Have you ever been backstabbed? Oh, Yes. See, so 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 the experience you have is like freaking unbelievable to sit here and be able to ask questions and, and, and get that knowledge. You know what always stabs you in the back of the hardest people who are negotiating with you? It's always the person with the little the littlest amount to say. It's always the Quiet person ones. with the three percent, five percent of the company that always have to object and you and everybody else, you're on the same page. But the person with nothing, that's all they have is a voice. They always ruin the deal. So they always uh, kind of uh, taint the deals. It's the ones you never, ever respect. You know, my wife and I were getting divorced, and let's say the kids, and we all understand, the lawyers understand, it's the goddamn dog. It's the dog that says something. Yeah, someone you'd least expect. Anyway. But so, so let me ask you a question. There's people out there starting a business, Right. They're, yeah, they're they're and later on we're doing a webinar. By the way, this this podcast will be released after the fact. If you're not registered, you're crazy. But look out for the next one, because I can tell you this: that webinar we're going to be teaching people first how to take an idea to an actual business, then how to nail your pitch and get an investor's attention or get an actual investor or investors, and then how to blow the thing up. 
how to get to a level of success only some people dream of. Now, if you ask me, Damon, tell me what your opinion is on this, because this is just my opinion. And a lot of the shit I say on here is my opinion. Yeah. But my opinion, like a lot of people out there talk about, you know, compete, don't compete, dominate. Mm -hmm. I believe in a different angle. I believe that if you create, right, if you're trying to compete with what's already in the universe, you're taken from somebody. You're, 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 if I compete with you, I'm taking your business. I'm taking food out of your mouth, out of your kid's mouth. But if I create and add to the universe, then, then I'm not taking from anybody. I'm only increasing. I'm only, I'm only making things more abundant. So I believe in, to, in, in, in creation versus competition. What do you believe? I believe in something similar, but, but, but it's a different cause to that reaction. I think that if you're going out and you're, you're steadily trying to compete with somebody, that means that you're going out and doing what you see them do now and you're trying to take market share from them. But you know, they're in a cycle that is six months to 18 months ahead of you. By the time you come out with these products and or ideas, they're already on to the next cycle. So if you're not thinking about how you can create, then you could potentially always be behind the competition. It's very common in the in the fashion industry. You know, every time we football jerseys were selling for Nike, the buyer would say to us, "Hey, I would bring you into Foot Locker if you make football jerseys." By the time you make football jerseys and you deliver them, you know, a year later, Nike's making soccer jerseys, and then you look like the idiot because you're just trying to compete instead of creating, you know, something new and or uh, a new direction. Right, then you're always behind, and that's how that's how I feel about it. So you're talking about <clears throat> instead of imitate, innovate, innovate, and if you can't innovate, then maybe you sh are doing the wrong thing because you know the the people who really are passionate and driven, very smart about their business, they're analytical and they're solving a problem. They don't have a shortage of ideas. See, folks, and that a sound happens. Oh, what's that? What happened? That's a bomb. That's a bomb. That means listen up. Well, when I'm here, we call it the biggity bomb. All right. Well, okay. the biggity bomb just there dropped. Okay. It's like, listen up when that bomb hits, because that means what he just said, even if you have to hit rewind, what he's saying basically is don't copy, or, or the new word for copy now is model. You yeah. heard that? They'll model after. Yeah. They'll model what you did. But that's yeah. called copy. Usually, you know, you know when you hear that when somebody comes on to the tank or in any place else, when they start off with... This industry is a so-and-so billion-dollar industry, and if I only got X amount of percent of it, that means they're going out to try to be part of the industry by copying what everybody else is doing, and they hope to only get one share of 5%, five, five percent, and all of a sudden they're going to be a gazillionaire. Mm -hmm. What well, never happens? See, now, if I were, if I were, I wish one day I could be an investor on that show. I mean, how much money do you have to have? Well, you know, they've, they've asked in the past some of the Sharks to show records. Uh, you know, I think they want you to have at least 50 in the bank. Um, if, I prove I can, if I prove I have 50 in the bank, which I don't, but if I did, would I be able to get on that show? Or would they, I have to have some other criteria? Um, I don't know. You know, I'm not the I'm not the casting people. You know, they uh, they peep. Could peep you put in a good, Could you put in a absolutely hundred percent? I saw you had a Rod when I was down visiting you on the set. You had a Rod in the green room. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to get on that show. Yeah. I mean, dude, how cool is it to have people parading good ideas? Even though you got to listen to a thousand yeah. bad ones, but dude, you got people parading good ideas. Yeah, and, no, it's and, an honor. And with the experience you have, you can spot a winner. Well, you know, I think, but I think it's symbiotic, right? I think that um, if I wasn't on the show, I probably would be doing business the old way, right? You know, making an imaginary shirt for an imaginary retailer who's going to sell it to an imaginary customer, and I didn't know who they were. And now after I'm on the show so many years, and I see so many people parade through the door time in and time out who are selling directly to their customer, and they're taking control of their life. I get to invest in people smarter than me, right? And I get to take a ride with them, use what I know as the fundamentals, add to them, give them a little bit of change, and then also be able to learn from what they're doing. And we both, that's called innovation. You know, sure we, both, we both work it out together. Yeah, and that's smart of you. Yeah, most people, Most people don't do that. They get all highfalutin. They think they know everything. Yeah, huh? they they get to a certain level of success, and they're not they're not wise enough to realize, dude. Someone else is coming to knock you down. Oh man, you got to keep learning. Day, you got to wake up every day and learn. Is that true? Every day. Another bomb dizzle right there. Bomb. But before we diggity get in, bomb, diggity bomb. 
Is yeah. that what you said? Biggity bomb. Now, before we get into those, I want to ask you a couple questions I've always been curious about. First of all, did did did, did Fubu buy Kuji? Yeah, yeah, we bought the brand Koji out of bankruptcy. It was an Australian brand. We bought the brand, I think, in two thousand and one. Okay, because I've got a Koji shirt that's freaking unbelievable. Uh huh. And you guys quit making it. Yeah. When, when, when do you decide to quit making shit? When it quit selling? No, not necessarily. When you're trying to create change, right? You're trying to make sure that you remember that piece, and you keep coming back to look for something very similar, but. You know, maybe that wasn't a staple item or maybe the factory or the machine that we made it with is no longer existing. So we we uh, we may have just moved on or maybe it got knocked off so much by the competitors that we decided that we're going to discontinue it so that we can offer new styles. S- stay creating. Yeah, stay creating. See, folks, listen up. Bomb diggities everywhere. No, Diggity no. bombs. Yeah. <laughs> so so the other question oh shit freaking that one slipped my mind but you know because i want that freaking Kuji shirt i ripped it basically one right. night and I'm, i've been online all over and i They're can't find it. it yeah there's another pair of jeans that i had that i i used to call my trustees i mean they were the baddest ass most comfortable jeans they looked the greatest they were perfectly faded it was awesome and they just quit selling them and now yeah. you can't find them which is stupid. If, but then again, I'm not in the fashion industry, so I was always going to ask, why do you do that? If they, if people keep wanting them, why do you discontinue them? We have some staple items, but maybe that's just an item that was, that was you know you were a fan of, and maybe it wasn't the you know, top selling brand. Like you know, the Levi's five hundred ones are going to be something that they'll always sell, right? The 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 Nike uh, you know Airs or the Shell Toe Adidas, they're staple items in, in in most brands. But other than that, you have to build around it uh, because you know fashion is fickle and people are gonna come and say, What's up? Where's the new stuff? So some stuff has to get sacrificed to bring the new stuff in. Yeah, now do you remember San Francisco riding gear? I don't even know how old you are. San Francisco I'm 49. Are gear. we at the same age? You younger? That would be Levi's or Lee's? Or no? no. San Francisco it was Riding. An, another company? Yeah, they had big old bell bottoms and shit. Oh, uh, no. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I well, well, Levi 501 <laughs> may have been, <laughs> may have been right that's, before that's you literally. showed up. Yeah. But I can tell you that back in the day, I was, I, I forget how old I was, 10, so 39 years ago. Yeah. The San Francisco Riding Gear bell bottoms were like, what's cool? Everybody had them. Well, those, my were, parents those were, were more skateboard company, like more, for more people who ride and skate, stuff like that, right? Well, I don't know. All I know is they were cool. Everybody yeah. wanted them. They were the expensive jean, and my family was poor. So guess what I got stuck with? What? 501s. They used to be the cheap jean. Yeah. They used to be the ones you got when you couldn't get the designer right. jean. Uh-huh. And then they became the designer That's jean. Right. Now, what do you think makes that happen? The name. Name brand, um, exclusivity, and or the fact that it became popular overseas, you know, and as it became popular overseas, people would come over here because they knew that they couldn't get them and afford them overseas, so they'd buy them here, and that would ratchet the price up. Do you think fashion starts overseas or here? No, fashion fashion starts wherever it does start, in the streets. Uh, you know, it really always, fashion mainly starts in the streets. Do you think it starts in the east and then comes to the west? Because a lot of times I go east, I see something. That's not here yet, and then I see it come here. In more in more dense cities where there are heavier populations, which would then also have sometimes a lot of times, you know, people who may not have the resource they want. That's where fashion started. You know, when you look at couture fashion or fashion in uh, Europe or the runways, it really came from the poor Europeans and Africans who didn't have anything. They would dig into the garbage and they would they would, they would get pieces of cloth, whatever they could, and they would put it together and then they would walk down the street and you would think they were wearing a million dollars. Fashion is an interpretation of generally and usually the poor. So let me ask you a question. And, and man, I, I just wish we had hours because I got a shitload of questions for you. But I want to also get back to your 37 years of experience. Yeah. T-shirts. Like, how does somebody, like, I always think I got a T-shirt idea that I yeah. think will sell a million T-shirts. Now, yeah. what happens? You go screen print a T-shirt with something funny, mm-hmm. like, you know, anything. I got a crooked boner. Yeah. And everybody goes, man, that's the funniest T-shirt ever. And it sells out in every shop in the world. Cool. Why don't more people 
do that? Is that hard? What's, That's very what's, hard. What's the challenge? It's very hard. The, the, well, the, first of all, the challenge is uh, <laughs> number one: how do you create? How do you create this following behind it? Right? <laughs> well, really, I'm just trying to get you to repeat. I have a crooked boner, but no, I'm just joking. That was, <laughs> you want me to repeat that you have a crooked boner? No, but that was that I have a crooked boner. That, that's just a saying that if, that if I saw someone with that shirt, it was funny. Because back in the day when we when we were working at a company, uh-huh. we used to slap people on the back say good job mm-hmm. and then they'd go out in public in the public uh showroom yeah and it would say shit on their back that's one of the things i'd put there and i always thought that'd be a funny ass t-shirt but to me a saying on a t-shirt could go viral pretty easily why wouldn't someone just fire off a bunch of different ideas on a t-shirt because a t-shirt and silk screen and then boom they do but you got to still go narrow and deep it's almost like being an entrepreneur with a million ideas right you know you got to go narrow and deep because there's gonna be so many different sayings from novelty shirts to people who own restaurants to people who are just you know putting shirts out uh that nobody can locate it i mean how can you go narrow and deep and locate this thing internet and, and what? Go narrow and deep with that? Well, then now you got to go into exactly what we're going to talk about, marketing and branding and creative following. Because after you buy the shirt once, all right, now you're walking around with you. I got a crooked boner shirt. What are you going to do? Huh? Hey. You're going you're gonna to come with the next one with I got a straight boner or I got a soft boner? <laughs> What's a soft boner? I, I'm no, confused next, right now. The next one is I got sand in my clam. <laughs> That's the next well, one. Yeah. Or your mom makes good pancakes. Yeah. That's, just just that's any, any of them that are just funny, random yeah. shirts. But internet, why couldn't I just put up a website and, and when, when it goes viral through social media, where do you get one of them freaking crooked boner shirts? Yeah, I think that's tough. <laughs> Pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the beginning. All right. Now, you were in Queens. Yeah. No, you were in- Queens. Queens. Yeah. Queens, New York. Queens, New York. You're running around. Who's your buddies? My buddies at that time? When I was a little kid is, you know, my buddy Alfred, my mother, my buddy Carl, Keith, and Jay, my buddies who became my partners in, um, in FUBU. So these guys were like close friends. Close friends, yeah. Okay, and any of them slinging drugs, any of them freaking fighting, any yeah. of them in trouble in any way? Yeah, yeah. My buddy Alfred was slinging drugs. Um, he ended up, he's still in jail for that. Yeah. Um, but the rest of us were pretty clean kids, you know, just uh, trying to stay out of trouble. Strict parents. Trying to, yeah, strict parents. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the bad stuff from the community was happening. They Those drug dealers trying to suck us in to, you know, become part of their crew. But uh, we uh, kind of kept ourselves together and said, no, we're not going to do that. Okay, good. So there you are in Queens, New York. And who came up with the idea? You? I did. And, I and what made you come up with an idea? You know, uh, you know, we loved hip hop. It was uh, this music that was just coming up, and nobody really respected it in the main media and the public. But we lived for it. It came with a way to walk, talk, and even dance. And it was our version of social media. It was how we were finding out what was going on in other cities and streets and, and neighborhoods because they were communicating through the music. We weren't seeing that on the news. And we had to keep buying, you know, product that we would reinterpret for the streets. We'd buy a ski jacket because we love the color, but who the hell needed Gore-Tex? We didn't need all that. We need to pay $1,000 for it. We need to pay $200 for it. Um, Timberland boots. We'd wear Timberland all the time. We were buying Timberland boots like the kids buy Jordans these Why? days. Why? Because the same reason I got Levi's? Because they were because just cool. you knew they were cool? They were cool. They who were decided? Cool. The rappers, because once the rappers are talking about it and wearing it, then, of course, we want to be like the rappers. Or maybe the streets were dictating what the rappers were talking about. Either way, it was, again, it was still that symbiotic relationship. And we just kept hearing that these companies just didn't love or respect the kids who like rap music or African-Americans or inner city kids. And we said, who's ever going to value and respect these people that, uh, that, that, that love this culture of music? And we came up with Forest Bias. That's awesome. So <clears throat> do you believe you were accidentally successful or intentionally? Because if anyone asks me, and and I don't consider myself a success, especially compared to you, but when someone asks me, I always say, first, I'm not successful yet. Secondly, I'm accidentally where I am. Were you accidentally, did you accidentally succeed or did you learn along the way and then eventually start applying what you're learning? I eventually started applying what I'm learning. You know, am I, is it an accident? Not necessarily. It, was it guaranteed? Absolutely not. 
You know, I failed at all my first couple of business ventures. I failed at FUBU many, many times. Um, But whatever I was going to deem myself to be successful, I wasn't going to let anybody stop me. And my level of success, I would have been I would have been very, very happy with a clothing store that my friends and I would have ran and we'd have been able to hopefully make a living. That would have been my level of success. So anything over that is greater. So that started out as that. That's it. I just wanted to dress people. I wanted to make sure that I had I was in control of my destiny so that not only was I dressing people, I owned my store. I decided when I was going to open it and close it, I treated my customers like they were superstars. And in return, they would come to me and buy the newest and best things that they wanted to wear. Yeah. So hanging around those buddies of yours, even though they were a little bit, one or a few were maybe doing some stupid shit. Yeah. What do you believe on you got to choose who you hang around? Hanging around the the wrong people will, will, will definitely be a barrier. 100% 100% hang around the wrong or hang around the right, right? You know, um, I didn't just have them. I had 20 different friends, but the ones when it came down to sewing shirts and delivering them at stores and uh, and doing that, many of them disappeared. And it was four or five of them said, I believe what you're doing. You see, when I started out in 89, you know, um, doing this, when I started out, it wasn't glamorous to be a designer. You know, um, you know, if you were a heterosexual male and you were going up to other people saying I'm a designer at that time, the the you know, they thought or the the idea was, you know, mostly gay men were designers. So uh, actually all my cool friends started to laugh at us um, and say, you know, what's wrong with these guys? But now, however, when now I was able to go into the video sets or go to some kind of uh, uh, flea market and sell the shirts and get to talk to girls. I was happy as hell. Sure. I was like, yeah, my friends think I'm gay. It's no problem. I'm out here talking to the ladies. I'm out here selling it to them and telling it to the guys. When I go to a video set to try to put it on a rapper, and when they kick everybody else off and say, get the hell out of here. You guys have no reason to be here. I had that one little rinky-dink shirt going, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> I'm here to dress the artist, please. So I'll, I'll, be, staying, <laughs> I'll be staying right here. It gave, it gave me five more minutes to like kill it on to me and kick me off, too. Oh, yeah. But it gave me validity and reasons to be part of different communities that I didn't have an entry or a reason to be part of so in 89 you started it. how many years went by before it actually started paying off well 89 i started i failed and closed it three times from 89 to 92 because i kept running out of capital and but you and you closed it so I it could have been dead it was dead three times Right. Then I started to uh, really put more and more capital in because I started to get more and more traction. And I started getting public recognition around 97, 98. But I mean, if it, if it was closed, how, what, what rejuvenated it? What? So it was, you know, it's, it's what real entrepreneurs do. True entrepreneurs, they act, they learn, and then they repeat. They take affordable steps and they try to learn their market and they, they start to get proof of concept. So I would sell, let's say I would take, I would take $1,000 and I would make, uh, you know, 200 shirts and I would go into a, a flea market and sell them. Right. Um, And then I would take the money and I'd realize, wait a minute, I had to pay to create the screen prints. I had to pay for shipping. I had to pay for a couple of neck tags. I don't have any more money left. I can't re up because I had to I owed all these bills. Right. So then I'd go back to work at Red Lobster as normal. And then all of a sudden, you know, a couple of people coming to Red Lobster going, hey, weren't you the one who sold me that FUBU shirt, man? Every time, just like you were just talking about that Kooji shirt Mm -hmm. or those jeans that uh, you bought back in the days when Jesus was wearing jeans too. He said, uh, you know, those FUBU shirts, man, I can't find it anywhere and everybody loves it. When are you going to make some more? So I'd save up enough money at Red Lobster working and I'd make another run. Yeah. Now I make make another run, and then it, then I would close it again because I ran out of more money, and it would happen again. The business started to call me back, and I started to feel like there was something special there, and that's why, you know, um, I kept opening it back up. So you could have been out of business had I, you had you been the normal, or let's just say the majority of entrepreneurs. They get a little trouble. They shut down and they don't open back up. And, you know, that's honestly after I had already closed two or three businesses before that. But when I closed the two or three businesses before that, I never had that feeling. 
I never had that feeling and that excitement that I wanted to do this again because the businesses that I had closed before that, I had done for money. I did the whole, this business is a $50 billion market and if I only get 1% of 1%. And I realized I was only trying to just make money and I had no passion or drive. I couldn't care less about the business itself. I cared about the end goal, but I had no knowledge on how to get to that end goal. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in a business where I'm starting to see people that are uh, they're grateful. They're cu- potential new customers. They want to buy more from me. I want to sell more. I can't wait to make more. And that's what kept calling me back to this because I learned what I didn't like in businesses prior. Mm-hmm. Did you get up early and work late or was it just whatever you felt like doing? No, no, no. I got up early. I work late, you know, um, as, as, as everybody here listening who has a business or, 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 you know, I was the first at the office, the last to leave. I, I, uh, I, I kept having to figure it out. You know, you act, learn and repeat. I kept making mistakes, but I kept saying, instead of this going, oh my God, let me close this thing. This is horrible. I go, ah, now I figured out what I was doing wrong. One step closer to doing something right. Mm-hmm. Once it just kept figuring out this puzzle, just kept kept the pieces of that jigsaw puzzle start falling into place. And you know when you start doing a jigsaw puzzle and you looked at you had these thousand pieces over here, now there's only two hundred pieces left. And I'm starting to put them together too. And I, I start to see this thing growing. I start to figure this thing out. I start to get more people around me. Then my customers are starting to become come around me more and more and more. And I start to start to dig myself into a little bit of a hole. But I also can see light at the end of the tunnel if I do things right, if I keep correcting what I'm doing wrong. Mm-hmm. There's a bomb or a diggity bomb. Hey, let me ask bomb you. So, so nine years later, or let's say eight, nine, eight, nine, nine, eight, yeah. Now, now shit starts popping off a little bit. Now it starts to pop. What was the big change? The big change was that I had created such a swell in the market that instead of going to taking the same energy I did to go to a local flea market or a local little show, I went to a big show. I went to Las Vegas, right? And I, I went Was out. it? Yeah, I went to Las Vegas and I said, All right, I could show this I could show this table of goods at the a magic? local local yeah. I, I said I could show this table of goods at a local flea market and maybe I sell a thousand units or I'll just take 40 units, each representing a style, and I'll go out to the magic show, and I'll show them, instead of showing 1,000 units to try to sell it $10 a piece, I'm going to try to sell 1,000 of each unit to stores. Mm -hmm. So now I go out to the magic show. And prior to going to the magic show, I mailed 300 copies of a picture I had taken of LL Cool J. Uh, And he was in a FUBU shirt. I waited outside his house all day. For him to take this picture and he took this picture and i sent 300 copies to all the stores I, I i can find the yellow pages and the white pages and the rap pages whatever the case is i said i'm going to be in vegas i go to vegas i can't afford to go to the trade show so i stay at the mirage hotel a couple of miles away i put up all my shirts in the corner of the room i go and sneak into the trade show I look at everybody's badges. I see you're from Macy's, you're from Dr. J's, you're from Jimmy Jazz. I tell you, hey, I'm in a hotel room a couple of miles away, but I got the FUBU stuff. And they write $300,000 of orders. Right there. That magic show, $300,000. Because I created a swell of, of seven years of them seeing it on videos, on hip-hop artists, on kids. And it literally, that only cost me five or $10,000 to put on all those artists because it was just the cost of the shirts. So, so you didn't know them. You just sent them a shirt? Yeah. So you just said, here, why would they wear it? Because it was well, a good-looking shirt. Well, first of all, I went over to them, and I, and, and I knew that their pain point was most big brands didn't respect or value them. So I said to them, hey, I know, I know that these guys are sending you stuff, but maybe they're not even sending it to you. Nike won't send anything. They don't care about you. But you know what? I'm from the streets, and we're out here. We're your fans. And I, if you just wear this shirt for us, this represents our culture. Yeah. And if you wear this shirt for us, yeah. If you wear this shirt for us, man, you're gonna be representing, baby. You sold them. That's right. And you sold them on an idea that that, that sounds like it stood strong. Like I'd be sold on that. Yeah. So that's so then so then these guys started wearing your shirts. You documented it, mm-hmm. and that caused a swell. Caused so then you so then you come out to Las Vegas Magic Show and sell a bunch of shit to them. That's right. And then you're in stores. Well, no. Now I got to make it. Now I got to make three hundred thousand dollars worth of shirts. So, so did you did you sell it before you even had it? 
I you, didn't have anything. Are you kidding me? I didn't have the. I didn't even have the money to go into the Magic Trade Show. I had to stay in a hotel room, uh, so I didn't have a dime. I actually had when I was out here. We had between my friends and I, we had twenty six dollars to eat. Now, see, there's something to this because when I started Lightspeed, we f- we went to a convention in the in the niche we were in or the niche we were in car dealers, mm-hmm. and we did a show. We did a trade show, and I borrowed, damn near stole, but borrowed. The nine thousand bucks it took me to get to that show. Mm-hmm. We stayed in a travel loge. It was in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. We were on, we were way over in the wrong part of town. Yeah, stayed at the travel loge because we didn't want to say travel lodge. <laughs> and we were selling the system that yeah. wasn't even built. We were selling the system yeah. that wasn't even built. You were selling clothes you didn't even have. Selling clothes I didn't even have. Now, see, there's got to be something to that because I've had a, I've heard other stories like that. What do you think that is? Smart. I mean, I think it's smart. It's, it's exactly a, it's, what I did. It, it, it's a little risky, um, you know. But 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 the the ease, the best thing about us is we didn't take anybody's cash. Anybody who offered us cash, we didn't take their cash. So that's not how the clothing business works. When I say I want three hundred thousand dollars worth of clothes, I don't give you a check. You, you no, you wrote me a you wrote me a order. Can you take that order to a bank? You can say? take it to the the bank and finance it. And I did take all the orders over to banks, but I didn't know how to fill out any. I didn't have any financial intelligence, so they all turned me down. Um, and then I would go ahead and, uh, refinance, uh, my house. E. Now that's, that's where it gets risky. Yeah. Real risky. Yeah. Well, if they're, if they're buying it, how, how risky can that be? Well, because again, being a kid with no financial intelligence, I was sitting there and I had to now pay for royal goods 90 days ahead of time. I was shipping and billing and paying out for my salary, my staff. And then I was giving those stores 30, 60, 90 day credit. So if I didn't have the money, the, the, the float, the float, float, float was going to choke me because I wasn't getting any money. I was only pushing out money, and the stores were paying me 30, 60, 90 days. Now, the, the gamble is what if the product hit the stores and they didn't sell? Well, the stores are going to bounce the goods. They're going to send it back to me. Now I'm going to be out of a $100,000 loan on my home, and I'm going to have a whole bunch of uh, uh, you know T-shirts in my garage that says Crooked Cock or whatever you called them <laughs> before, you know? Can't go to the bank with crooked cock shirts, you no, know what I mean? it's crooked boner. Same thing. The word boner's funny. Co- <laughs> the word cock is pretty funny, too. Cock's not funny. Boner's no. funny. I got a crooked boner. That's just, fun- <laughs> That's just funny shit. Now, now, let me ask you this. You, you went and took that risk. You built the shirts, obviously, and you delivered them. Now, that was in 97, 98. How, how long I did- didn't. What do you mean? I ran out of capital. I ran out of cash. Uh, I I basically you know took the took the took that loan on my home. I, I burned all the furniture in my house um, and moved uh, industrial sewing machines in because I didn't want to trust my money overseas with factories or places I didn't know. I hired a bunch of seamstresses and I started sewing and cutting the shirts right there with a staff of about eleven people. Um, because of being choked by the float, I turned around and the hundred thousand dollars is now five hundred dollars left. I didn't deliver the shirts. I was late on delivering the shirts, uh, and I was four months late on the mortgage, and they were going to take my house. So I was about to lose everything. So my mother comes home and says to me, "You need you need a strategic partner." I said, "I don't know what the hell a strategic partner is." She takes out an ad in the New York Times, and it says, "Million dollars in orders need financing." Hmm. And, well, I'm smart. And 33 people called. Now, 30 of them were loan sharks. 30 of them had way worse deals than Kevin O'Leary deals. <laughs> way worse. And one of them was Samsung's textile division. We would later on do a deal with Samsung's textile division because they saw that I had proof of concept. They saw that I was able to sell these shirts in the middle of the, or sweatshirts in the middle of the summer if I had to. And that's important for people to know here about proof of concept. Because even though my sales weren't, dramatic enough when you look at somebody like a Samsung, mm-hmm. they were proof of concept. They showed how the stores were viable and they want something. So I always tell people, uh, you know, if you don't think you can get a deal on a th- for a thousand dollars in sales in Shark Tank, you're absolutely wrong. Because if your product is five dollars and you said you opened up your trunk and you sold a thousand dollars worth of it in twenty minutes, then you have a million dollar deal right there. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was able to show Samsung was that I had proof of concept. I can turn the goods. The retailers wanted them, so did the consumers. And we ended up doing a manufacturing deal. But if I did not get that call from Samsung or those three other viable people, I would have been done. I would have lost the house. I would have lost the company. I would have lost everything. Well, I have a feeling we'd still know who you were. 
one yes, way you or another. Yes, you, you would have came back with something else. Because I would have robbed the bank the week after. Yes, you yeah. would have known who I was. I'd I always, be dead. I always say that. Like, I'm going to, you're going to know who I am one way or the other, even if I have to be like a, a famous criminal. <laughs> so, so, so 97 and 98, that happened. See, people don't understand, man. They, 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 they just see you now. And they think, oh, yeah, he put yeah. a shirt on LL Cool J, and lucky for him, yeah. then everybody wanted his shirt. It was all good, yeah. yeah. And then he made a bunch of money. Yeah, and now it's crazy. easy to make money once you have money. So yeah, what, of course. What, yeah. There was no challenge. No, nothing, nothing at all. So between 97 and when, did were, did you finally say, like, I'm, I'm arrived, I've been here. I, like, I win, because I still don't <clears throat> think I've won. Now, I've won compared to my freaking cousin, yeah. who, who's a dipshit. But, you know, there's people way above me. You know, I don't. Um, I think maybe uh, around two thousand. I, I hear you have an eighty acre lake. Is that right? Yeah, I have, I have some, on like some, some, on like like a thousand acres or something. Yeah, I have a couple of acres. You know, um, so so that tells me that that you're somewhat successful at this time in your life. Well, I, you know, I, I think that when, when I realized that I had a certain level of success and I, I, you know, anybody smart enough knows that, you know, success is something that you keep working on and mastery is something you keep working on. Um, I think that uh, it was right around 2005 or 2006 when I had then bought Kuji and I brought so many other brands because, Food was doing well, and I was, and, and I said to myself, though, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe I just got one bite of the apple, maybe I got hit by lightning, you know? Let me check my, let me check myself and see if I can, you know, what what are my assets here? I'm a good distributor and manufacturer of product, right? So okay, so now let me use this 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 distribution channel to J.C. Penney, Macy's, and everybody, and let me let me let me go out and acquire the brands. I acquire, I license Ted Baker. I don't do well with Ted Baker. I give it back to them because they want to own retail stores. I license Kappa, Kappa, the the soccer brand. It doesn't do well because soccer doesn't grow in the United States the way the way I'd like to. I get a brand named Heatherette, uh, bu- brilliant kids who were doing a, a a great job, and I try to interpret it for everyday retail. I failed at it. Then all of a sudden, I get well. They wh- failed at it too because I ain't never heard of none of them except Ted Baker. Well, okay, then Kuji. Then Koji starts to take off, and then I start to go, okay, I'm not just a one-hit wonder. And I start to feel comfortable with myself at that point in my life. Um, but, you know, again, you know, people- That was 2000 what? 2006, maybe. So that's basically 17 years. Yeah, seven- 17 years of hard knocks, 17 yeah. years of yeah. learning your way. And then 17 years later, you took inventory, which basically, you basically said, what have I learned in 17 yeah. years? Absolutely. And then, and then you started feeling like a success. That's when shit really started. Then I, then I started feeling okay. Not a success, but I started feeling like, you know, um, I, I can be around and I can do this a little bit more. Um, but, you know... Uh, you know, I don't. I don't know how some people feel like a success. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how can people feel like a success. You got to get to. A, you got to get to a serious level where you're happy. Uh, I think spiritually, as a as a, you know, was I success in the in the corporate world? But was I a great dad still? You know, success is something that is so many different facets of it. You know. And I think you know people always ask, what's the key to success? I always say there is no key. It's a combination, and and you're the only one that has it. Meaning. What's successful to you may not be successful to me and vice versa. That's right. You know, parenting, you know, being a good dad is definitely part of it, you know, but also money's part of it. Some people want to act high and mighty and say money's not important. To me, money's yeah. very important because in order to, it, for me, my combination of success means that you can have anything you need. Why? Because if you want to increase your potential, right, and I do, I want to reach as high as I can reach I think that you need money to reach your potential. Why? Because in order to develop, to develop yourself and your potential, you need to use things. You need to have access to things, books, people, circles, influence, you know. A certain amount of money, right? Because, and, and, you know, you and I may, may object on this. You know, some people just want 
more and more money, more and more houses. You know, I, I had one time I had seven houses and I had so all these things going on. And I realized that my friends were enjoying the things more than I was. Yeah. And why was I doing it? Why do I need to, and, you know, thank God Instagram wasn't out, but you look today at Instagram. Why are you trying to buy so much stuff to impress a whole bunch of people that you don't know? Right. So it's all about what what is money right you know i would uh, say if i had enough, if i had all the money i spent trying to impress people back it'd be yeah. impressive yeah i look at right now you know a lot of people i you know I, I fly private when i need to when it's a full staff i need to get someplace in time or i'm on one of the group share jets right and when i'm on planes people go oh my god why aren't where, where's your jet yeah, but if I'm flying to California and a round trip to California, me and my buddy are flying to California and it's $60,000 and I'm only going to get there two hours later if I fly commercial. And by the way, commercial has beds when they don't have beds on private jets generally. So you're telling me I'm going to, if I had to buy first class tickets, it's $5,000 for me and my buddy. That means I save $55,000 for, tra- for waiting for two hours. I got paid $55,000 for sitting for two hours. Operating a full jet is going to be an average of, if you look at the pounds of fuel and you look at the jet itself, it's about $5 million a year. Let's say four. You're going to be out of about $55 million in 10 years to operate that jet. And you're going to have to make about $85 million of it to, before taxes. Yeah. $85 million in 10 years. Now, if I was just flying commercial, let's say I only spent $10 million of that. I have seventy five. million million dollars left to invest and to do that and guess what i was on JetBlue, laying in the bed and she's bringing me one of those little minty vodkas every three hours so where is the money why that's why we look at the athletes and everybody else if you don't have two to five hundred million dollars in the bank you should not be flying private all the time you waste your front and i and you know what on top of that because i i, I always struggle because i want to live that lifestyle and I'm even thinking, well, I don't need to own it. I'll just charter it. But it's the same principle. The only time I think a jet would make sense is if you need to be in five cities in one day to collect a hundred grand per city. Hundred percent. Then you then you need it, right? Then you yeah, need it exactly. Then and it, and then plus, it I'm a, I'm a little bit of a tree hugger too. I don't want to I don't want to burn you know all that gas. So right now, you know, I'm I'm with you hanging out. I got to go back to the strip after this. It's like me chartering a tour bus to take me home from here. How are you getting back? I'm gonna walk. <laughs> No, seriously. I'm going to walk with my crooked cock shirt on are in we, the streets and we, see are, what happens. Are you going to Uber or take some Of course I'd Uber. Bar? I'll Uber. I'll get one of your guys to, to take me back. Yeah. See, again. I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, man. I'm a simple guy. Yellow cabs, man. And at the end of the day, how many people are out there fronting that are broke? They look rich, but they're actually broke. I see them all the time, brother. And guess what? Would you rather be rich or look rich? Who are you fronting for? Because at the end of the day, who's going to take care of your family? Yeah, and shit right. can happen, can't yeah. it? Yeah, well, ho, oh, it happens, right? And when and I got I have no debt. No debt. And you know that that I have I have a couple of hundred acres. My house is so small cuz I just like to go there and close it up and come back, you know, just stuff for, when you when you have mansions, guess what? You're only, you're only in the kitchen sometimes, the living room a little bit watching TV and your bedroom. Yeah, that's it. When you have a 24 mansion, you're going to sleep in every one of the goddamn beds all the time. So, so what's it really for? I don't know. It's for front. Why don't you have you been to Mark's place, Mark Cuban? I have. Does he does he live? Because he's got a couple of bills, doesn't he? I yeah. Mark has a couple of bills. I mean, once it once it once it like gets to a level of billions, can't you squander because it doesn't matter? Because the money you have in the bank makes you so much you can't even spend it. Yeah, but he he's pretty he's pretty tight. He he rides around, and I think he it's a it's a it's a two thousand in. 11 Lexus, um, you know, wears the same jeans all the time. And he's just a, he's a beers and chip kind of guy. You know, he just rides around. You know, I, actually, I went to his, uh, I went to Dallas one time. I said, hey, Mark, let's go, you know, I'm going to meet you at the office. He said, no, he showed up at the damn hotel, damn near in his pajamas. And he said, I ain't been in my office in three years. I want to sit home with my son, Jake, and I want to, I want to look, answer my emails. Why do I need more money? He said. Yeah. Well, his money makes money. Oh, yeah, your, money. your money makes money. So my money makes eh, his money makes money. Yeah, but that's the goal, man. The if goal I is, had his money, I'd burn mine. The go, the whole goal, folks, all the people listening, the whole goal is to get enough money to where if you didn't do a damn thing, it you're makes making it for money. You. That's right. So let me ask you a question. Then we'll wrap this up. If you went back and could do it all over, right? You yeah. Went, you went back to eighty nine. You started today. How much time do you think? 
would, how much time could you shave off knowing what you know now, but starting again, like starting from fresh scratch? I saw in 89, I would be 93 to 94. I think I would, um, so, so you would have, you would have took 75% of the pain and journey and time it took you to reach a level of success off. Yeah, if I knew what I knew now. If you knew what you knew now. Yep. Unbelievable. And did you ever get dicked along the way? Like, not not dicked, but like, were you ever like, you know, screwed over to a point where you're you're pissed about it. Not oh, pl- like dick to plenty of times. You know, stole you know, I, I I talk about my my three other partners, but we went through six versions of those three partners. That that fifth member of Fubu never stayed there. Who um, did it end up remaining? Uh, me, myself, my partner Carl, Keith, and Jay. Um, but we had other partners who never stayed. Um, you know. D- did I get, you know, it's very hard to say if I got screwed because I always look at myself being the buck stops at me and did I, was I stupid enough to, to, to allow somebody to screw me? So because I took affordable steps, I don't feel like I got screwed, I hate to say it, because there's nothing else that can happen to me that's out of my power. Yeah. I allowed somebody to do that. If I decided to uh, build a $20,000 website when I need a $1,000 Facebook page, if somebody says, well, the guy screwed you for $20,000 uh, for a website, I would say to myself, why didn't I do my homework and look deeper into it? No, I'm the idiot. I, I, I was lazy. I let that person talk to me there. You know what I mean? I let that person say, hey, I got all the answers for you. And I know that nobody has all the damn answers for me unless I listen to what they're saying and I take it in and I absorb it and I compare the notes and then I take small steps to utilize them. So I, I don't know. Nobody, unless somebody put a gun to my head, so you're just you're just taking responsibility for making stupid choices, but at the end of the day, sometimes people don't know what's out there. Like there's people right now starting where you're starting, or maybe they're even three years into it, and they're getting dicked left and right. Their buddies screwing them. They took an investment they shouldn't have taken. They took an investment. But they're not taking the, the time to learn. That's the problem, right? They're not taking the time to learn what they need to do, right? They, you know, um, I knew that every single thing was in a book or in a curriculum or something that I had to do. I would go to Tony Robbins type of classes. I would read Think and Grow Rich. I'd read the story of Genghis Khan. I'd read. I'd look on the USPTO site to see about trademarking and licensing. I would go to uh, seminars where I see that there are attorneys and or experts are giving you a good amount of information free to start off with. And if you're ready to extend your education, I would do that. I would just keep educating myself. Man, see, I wish I could say anything other than there's a lot of people that I've talked to that have reached a level of success and every single one of them seem to have that trait. When did you learn that, that to get the knowledge is actually valuable? Like how long did it take you? Is that one of the things that would have shaved off time? That would have shaved. Up, that would have shaved off the time. Okay. It took me, you know, just going around in circles and not realizing that there are good people and or resources that it's always out there, and that the con artists are the ones trying to sell you these expensive things for a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. Go leverage your home and your house and your family, and we'll take care of everything for you, um, and tell you that you don't have to put in the work. I realize that those people, those those people, you know what their product is? Their their product is your insecurity. Yeah. And I realized that whether somebody wanted to sell me a pill to make me skinnier in the gym and tell me you never have to do a push-up again in your life, no, I'm fat because I know that I'm eating wrong yeah. and or I'm not exercising. So there's no shortcuts. You just have to put in the work with the resources that are available to you. Yeah, well, that's why they call it work is because it works. And then let me ask you a question. How much time would you have saved? If, if, no, no, no. How much money? I said time, right? You said three quarters of the time. Yeah. Instead of taking 17 years, it would have taken you three to four. How much money would you have saved if you went back and started over? How much, how much money have you lost learning this information? Well, there's two type of levels of loss, right? There was the money that I lost without having the financial intelligence and or the education. And then there was the money I lost because of squandering, not knowing how money works. I would have probably saved about $30 million over the course of, uh, over the, course of the time. Thirty million smacks and divided by seventeen years, that's almost two million dollars a year. Yeah. Two million dollars a year. And and like me, if I look back at my life and I say, What have I what have I done wrong? I'm gonna come out with a book, it's called The Hard Way. Yeah. Which is basically shit I learned the hard way, so you don't have to. It's for people coming up. 
And, and it's because I had to learn the hard way just until not even three, four, five years ago that I start realizing, dude, I don't have to go figure this out myself. There's mm-hmm. people that have already figured out a lot of shit. And I always thought, oh, you know, I got to figure it out myself. I have to learn the hard way. Mm-hmm. And you know how many people are out there right now learning the hard way when there's people that have already been there, done that, that know exactly what to do. And people say, well, it's not, it doesn't, doesn't relate to me. You know, he, he sold clothes, I'm selling plumbing. Dude, whether you get a LLC or an S Corp, whether you, you know, file taxes this way or that way, there's so many things that whether you're selling shirts or you're selling shitters, if you could save a shitter company a bunch of money, which by the way, when, when someone invests in Shark Tank, I mean, goes to Shark Tank, gets an investor, the money, if you ask me, is like, this much of what it is they're actually getting. They're getting your knowledge. Yeah, I mean, look at how many people just learn off of Shark Tank. You know, before Shark Tank was out, how did you learn what a viable, um, you know, potential investor is going to ask you when they get in the room, right? So how many people may have just have an idea of this one thing, but they were watching somebody pitch, you know, a company on soft drinks and they learned certain aspects of it, the fundamentals of it. It's it's all around us. You learn every single day. It's it's right there in front of us. So it's not that you have to go pick it up yourself because Shark Tank's a perfect example. People watch it religiously because every single night they, they pick up one little thing that makes them just a little bit smarter in running their business. What do you think the best product ever on Shark Tank was and did you invest in it? Well, it's going to have to be if we only look at quantifying by number. It's going to look at it's going to be the company that um, only Kevin O'Leary made an offer on one of his blood sucking royalty offers. But it's the company Ring that just sold for a billion dollars to um, to Amazon. A billion? One billion. And what was Ring? Ring was when you hit the doorbell, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it comes onto your phone yep. wherever you're at. Uh, yep. And Amazon just bought that company for a billion dollars. And and what could have Kevin O'Leary got if the guy said yes? I'm not sure, but uh, the guy would go ahead. And what was he asking for? Do you remember? I don't recall, but if you ask him now, he says he was asking too much on the show because um, now he's away. he's a shark himself now, right? Um, and I think he he went on to raise a couple of different raises. I think he raised about 250 million over the course of two years or three years after the show. Uh, but he still sold for a billion dollars, which it shows that he didn't stop. Uh, he went and he got on a shark tank. He got knocked down. He was very upset about it. But then he restructured his business and then found found other investors. And, um, you know, so you look at that. And now he went on to employ hundreds of people and he'll change other people's lives and he'll put money into the ecosystem and be another shark. How important do you think getting investment capital is? I don't think it's that important, to be very honest. I think the right strategic partner is important. And I think that if you take in money too soon, you could potentially hurt your outcome on being a successful entrepreneur because now you are using other people's money as tuition. You may end up hurting the the integrity of the investment and or the brand. So go figure it out first as well as you can, very, very small. Scale to a level where you cannot keep up with the orders. Once you cannot keep up with the orders and or things like that, if you need strategic partners, capital, distribution, as our buddy Jay Abraham would say, OPM, other people's money, marketing, mind power, manpower, as soon as you need that, then you bring it in. It's almost like, you know, you need different artillery when you're going into a war, right? Yeah. But, you know, why Why are you trying to carry a big bazooka on your back when you're just trying to walk to the war? You know, get the bazooka out when you're ready, right? And that's yeah. what money is. Money is a bazooka, a tank, a grenade, right? So uh, you just be very careful when you bring in money. Don't think that, you know, don't let the world spoil you. You need money to make money. No. You want to own is and retain as much of your company as you can at first and then when you're ready to sell portions of it, you want it to be worth ten thousand, a hundred thousand. Not, I'll give you fifty thousand dollars now when it's worth fifty percent of your entire company, because then you go and try to raise another two hundred thousand dollars. Well, I'm not giving up the fifty percent that you sold me. Now all of a sudden you're working for, you know, now you own ten percent of the company and you're you're miserable. Wait till you grow a little bit, learn those mistakes, or. If you fail, then you didn't screw up a whole bunch of other people's money. Or these VCs that put money into companies all the time, like you and the sharks. That's why they call you sharks. I mean, if, if somebody, let's say, I don't want to say half-assed, but naive, somebody naive took your money, you could make a contract that just freaking dick them. 
And they oh, yeah, wouldn't you even could, know it. You could, you could take the company, but you know. Because all I see is a million dollar check. I'm excited. I got a million dollars for 20% or 50% if, of my if company. You, the wrong people will, 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 will hurt you like that. Absolutely. You got to know. But the agreements, how much, I mean, how, how well do you know agreements where you could spot an agreement loophole or problem? The instead? contracts always, always. That's the devil's in the details, right? You don't go 50 50 with anybody when you're starting off with a partner because 50 50 means you're going to lock up in uh, mitigation and or there's no tiebreaker, right? So then all of a sudden, it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere, right? I may decide, hey, I want to retire and give the company to my daughter. And all of a sudden, my daughter is somebody who you don't want to be part of. And then now the IP, the intellectual property of the brand and or all its assets are tied up, right? So you need 5149, whatever the case may be. There can be various triggers in the company. I'll give you an example. You know, one of my deals that I have with a clothing company, I said, listen, I want to be able to sell this stuff to to Burlington or TJ Maxx in the event that, you know, you make some stuff that doesn't really look good. And the designer was like, how dare you? All my stuff is going to sell immediately. I said, okay, well, we may have $5 million or $10 million of purple ruffle shirts that you decided to create and I want to get rid of them and you don't want me to put them in the lower category to get rid of them because you think it'll hurt the brand. But if you don't sell the shirts within 120 days, then they go over and I'm allowed to sell them. You can put various triggers on any kind of thing you do in regards to brands, licensing, anything else like that. The devil's always in the details and that's experience talking. that's experience folks listen if you guys are wondering how in the fuck did brad lee the real brad lee get damon john to come <laughs> hang with his ass again it's experience bro devil's in the details but here's what i here's why i i am i am i am lucky enough to sit here and pick his brain for you so you can learn from him is because he utilizes the light speed technology to to develop an interactive training technology where he's out training corporations, individuals, and whatnot. So his system's called Damon On Demand. If what you heard today, and by the way, this is like a fraction of what's in there. Am yeah, I there's right? eight hours in there, right? It's, there's content it's, in there uh, about contracts, taxes, relationships, not to mention, dude, you're bringing in all those people that you've met along the way where I wouldn't even get to know those people if I wasn't already at some certain level of success. Yeah. So you're literally introducing them to some of the top resources, top subject matter experts. You're talking about contracts, tax law, <laughs> S-Corp, C-Corp, LLC, the different between this, the difference between that, the shit we're talking about, and then some, he's developed an interactive training technology, and that's fortunately why he gets to hang out in my studio. Otherwise, he <laughs> wouldn't even know who I was. But because the Bomb Squad is someone, is a group of people that I think, you know, deserve to get the knowledge direct from the source because this whole thing, my whole passion, Damon, is to get the knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it because. Again, just what you said, you'd save you'd save 12 years growing. You'd save yeah. millions of dollars if you knew what yeah. you knew now. Why don't we help them? And I know that you were involved in the Entrepreneur Ambassador Program. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Presidential Entrepreneur uh, uh, Ambassador Program for uh, Barack Obama. So I know you sell this for 2500 bucks or something like that. Yeah. How, how about we give the bomb squad the ability to buy this at some sort of discount? How about like, you know... A discount. I'm down. Listen, I, listen. As long as listen, you know, you know. Earlier, what I said about if you are creative or you have ideas or information, I'm giving my information anywhere and everywhere I can. Whether we're here on on you know uh, on the podcast or whether you see me free on uh, Shark Tank, as long as people are going to go out and they're going to utilize this stuff and they're not going to make the mistakes I did, right? Because I did source. I sourced all the all the because every time I speak. People have so many questions. So I did bring in my tax experts, my branding experts, my legal and stuff like that. And I want people to be able to use it. So then when people don't use it, I always go, well, why are you asking me the secret to success? It's right here in front of you. And people just don't believe it. But the people, if your people are going to use it, then I'm happy, man. Let's, let's do it. Step by step. So listen, folks, if you guys want a discount, and I don't even know what it is yet, but I know the code word I want to make is bombs. And since this comes out, a little bit, a few days from now. The code word is bombs. Matter of fact, if we're Facebook Live and you're Instagram Live and you go to DamonOnDemand.com right now and drop in bombs and at least until this thing ends. So so uh, tell Frank 
that we need to leave this on. I know that like, if you ever give a discount, it's always like, you know, until you leave the building, mm-hmm. but leave this on. Cause I'm going to drop this in three or four days. And I forgot that people are watching live. So people are probably going to go there right, right now. now. Yeah, yeah. So bombs and, and knock, you know, let's say, let's, let's make it 997, 997. Can we do that? All right. So $997 folks. Now listen, this is what's funny. I wish I could fi- figure out who the hell's listening to this, who's watching live, because if for $997, you don't believe that 20, 37 years of hindsight, 37 years of knowledge and resources and high-level contacts, and basically a, a, a roadmap to where the bombs are, if you don't think 997 is worth that roadmap, then honestly you probably should get out of business altogether because you're, <laughs> you're a motherfucking idiot. <laughs> Am I lying? And again, you I've, know, I'm, I've I'm been that idiot. I'm not here to insult your people. But, Dude, I've been know. that idiot. I've been that idiot. I would have told people before, 997, you can blow me. Like, yeah. shit, dude, are you crazy? But, yeah, I, but, I, I used to do that, and I used to go to the club. I remember when, my, when I first started making money and the financial advisors came around, and I said to them, I was, I was a little cocky. I was like, listen. You know, you got your little pen, pencil in your pocket and all that stuff, and you don't look like you made a couple of million like I. So why am I listening to you? Maybe you should listen to me. Yeah. But the important thing was they were they were there to explain to me and explain to me how to make money work for me. Before that, I was working for the money. Yeah. Right. And they they would show me how to make money work for you. And you know, there's a great saying. You know, uh, you know, money is a great slave, but a horrible master. And I at that point. Threw them all away. Then, when I blew my ten million dollars, I said, um, "You know, uh, you know what? That stuff you were saying to me, uh, I'm ready to hear. I'm ready to listen to you." And thank God, I was an athlete who had peaked in my career. I had already had a business that I was kicking off. You know, a good amount of money, so I was making it. But I would have been bankrupt if I didn't listen to myself later on and say, "Hey, I do need the knowledge." Yeah, well, that's a bomb right there on the spot. And I know personally. I always say, listen, it took me 18 years to get to where I am. Pro- yeah. It's probably going to take me 25 years to get this to a billion-dollar place. So it's 18 years so far. And if I could start over, I could do it in 18 months, learning yeah. what I've learned. And I don't I haven't even learned it all. Yeah. And if you bring it down to the core of what would make me so much extra, it, you know, what would be my advantage? I would know to buy a program like that, to pay you for your mentorship, to find the people that I want to freaking learn from that have been where I'm going and freaking nail it. And because Damon On Demand is all about entrepreneurial, it doesn't matter if you're a plumber, a freaking doctor, a chiropractor, a freaking clothier, a designer, or a freaking farmer. You know, business is business. Oh, people people don't realize how important they are to businesses. You know, in this country, there's 29 million small businesses and 21 million of them are operated by one man, one woman, mom and pop shops, right? And that is big business. So the country is ran by one, every hairdressers, plumbers, farmers, whatever the case, masseuses, those, that's, 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 that's the business, so if you guys want $30 million worth of advice, how to save $30 million, and more importantly than money, if you want to save time off your journey, man, go to Damon On Demand, type in the word bombs, and get yourself this program. And that's for life, I believe. Normally, it's per year. Frank is nodding yes. It's for life. You'll never have to freaking buy it again. It's not some annual thing. And I'm telling you guys, you're going to thank me later. Damon, I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you for having me. You guys unbelievable podcast i'm gonna freaking put rank this up to the number one podcast i've ever put out there only because the knowledge this guy's bringing was freaking off the chart bomb diggity diggity bomb (laughs) damon thanks for coming thanks man folks go out there rate this share this you know put a tag on facebook and share it out there and uh if if you like it share it with someone you like appreciate you listening until next time Mm -hmm.